Hi everyone, welcome to this very last presentation of uh, the conference. I know everyone is tired, so this is gonna be a really hard presentation, just to make things worse. All right, a little bit about me. My name is Stanislav Kromov. I am a WordPress developer at Aftonbladet, which is part of uh, Shipset Media Group. And uh, I've been working with uh, publishing houses for the past five years, and I think that uh, just uh, the publishing space is a very interesting, um, very interesting area where there's a lot of things happening. People are talking about the shift from um, analog to digital and things like that, and that's just really exciting. So let's talk a bit about WordPress, first of all. Uh, what makes WordPress good? I think the excellent community is one thing. Uh, the fact that it has a thriving ecosystem of um, plugins, themes, and developers. It has a great um, admin backend. If um, any of you have been following along on the Make blog, they, they keep posting about different um, you know, progress and asking the community for feedback on, on how the, the admin looks and feels to make it intuitive. And of course, it's got a, a, a huge uh, market share. So that's good things. But what, is, what are some of the lesser good things about WordPress? Uh, well, for one, it's, uh, it's quite difficult uh, to scale. And uh, it's slow. And some diehards may be kind of going like that. No, no, it's not slow. But in fact, it's been proven over and over that, that WordPress is among the slowest CMS system, if not the slowest. Uh, and, um, but that may be the price that we, we have to pay for all the, the good things that WordPress brings to the table. So let's talk about what makes WordPress slow. Um, in general, you could say that about 70 to 98% uh, of of uh, execution is happening in PHP, so it's actually not most often it's not the database that's holding you down. It's it's WordPress itself, and the CPU, the processor, is almost always the bottleneck. So there's a huge incentive um, to try to reduce um, the amount of traffic that goes into WordPress, and also when you're reaching you know, uh, pretty high traffic levels, then things also start to, to get really, really hard. You have to start scaling out to multiple servers, uh, and just bringing it all together and keeping it working is very hard, and that's something we're going to discuss here today, how you can do. But first, let's talk a bit about uh, traffic and how traffic works. I mean, when you say somebody has a million daily page views, that does sound like a lot, but then when you when you calculate it, it's actually just, as we can see in the graph here, it's a million page views is only 11.6 requests per second, and that doesn't feel uh, too bad, really, and that's what I thought at, at first as well. I'm like, well, I mean, 12 requests a second, that's that's no problem. But uh, the truth is that these, these values aren't always um, representative, the mean value. So we have to be prepared for, for spikes, in traffic as well. So here's just uh, um, some stats I pulled from uh, from our WordPress uh, site at uh, Aftonbladet. And you can see here that the traffic varies very heavily uh, depending on, on the time of day. And uh, you can also see that it, there's a, you can find this, a sort of pattern in there as well. So let's let's zoom into a single day and check out how that can look. So after we zoom in, we can start to kind of try to analyze what what are the, all these peaks and valleys coming from. So obviously during during the night people are asleep, so you're not seeing a lot of traffic coming in. Uh, but then when people go at work, apparently the first thing they do at about 9 a.m. is to get on get on uh, on in the internet and start <laughs> browsing. And then we also see just steady traffic up until about 1 p.m. where people are coming back from lunch and, uh, um, well, I mean, they're just checking their email and stuff like that. And then the traffic drops off when people are going back home and up again during late night browsing. So, 
as we can see, the mean traffic values aren't very, very accurate at all, and we have to be prepared for, for big traffic spikes. So let's look at a, a, a bit more realistic example. Uh, you know, these peaks, they can be even more than two times the traffic, but let's just take two times the traffic as, a, as an example. So now, uh, if you have a million uh, page views daily, then your, um, your uh, peaks can be as high as 23 or even more requests per second. And that's when you start to also realize that it's, that's starting to be a lot. Uh, just if you take an example, if you have a WordPress page that takes one second to generate from the WordPress backend, um, then you'd need to have uh, six quad core servers just constantly chewing WordPress to, to have that kind of uh, throughput. And that's leaving no wiggle room at all for errors. And also, not all uh, requests, no, we, we, so far we've talked about page views, but actually, you know, each time a WordPress page is viewed, there's more than one request coming in. Um, not all requests go to WordPress, so if you have CSS files or JavaScript files that you are queuing on the page, I mean, these have to go to your web server too. So, in fact, um, you can have, you know, 20, 30 requests per page view coming in, and that takes up, also takes up uh, valuable, valuable processing time. And, of course, static file resources, they aren't as heavy to serve, but uh, they still use up, um, they still use up time on the web server. And just as a note, this can be helped if you're using a content delivery network for your static assets, such as CSS and JavaScript, then that will help as well. So the solution to this is uh, full page caching. And full page caching is the, is the most common way to, to improve uh, just raw performance when you're having high traffic. And um, you can have just huge performance increases um, because instead of going to WordPress every time, you're actually uh, saving what the, what the page looks like, and then you're just serving that saved representation to, to people instead. So that means that uh, you could have something like uh, only five or even less percent of the request go through uh, to the back end. And there are a lot of solutions available for this. So here are some plugins that you can install for WordPress that provide this for you. Um, and the way they work, um, most of these, if we start looking at this, this is like a kind of typical uh, WordPress setup. You have like your regular user that's coming in to, to view a page. You have Apache or some other web server that is connected to, uh, that also parses PHP. Uh, that then goes back to WordPress. WordPress does all of its processing. It contacts the MySQL database and also memcached if you're running an object cache. And what the, the cache plugins do is basically they, they insert themselves um, between the, uh, the browser, uh, sorry, the, the, the Apache server and, and WordPress. So if you're an anonymous visitor, You'll, you'll never reach WordPress, or you'll just come to the web server level or just very early in the, in the WordPress execution, and then you're going to be served what's already cached content. Unfortunately, there's a problem with this for, for logged in visitors. Um, if a visitor is logged in, we, we can't really save their, um, their page view, because we, we, if we did, we, we might mess stuff up. If, uh, I log in and I have the admin bar, and then we save that as that this is the way the page looks. The next anonymous person that comes in is going to be served that, and is going to see my admin bar. And well, it usually isn't a big problem, but it's not really something we want. So uh, most cache plugins simply, uh, whenever they detect that you have cookies, which means you're logged in, um, they simply pass you through the cache without, without stopping you. Which means that you can still um, you can still log in and everything works, and anonymous users uh, can still get cached page views. And this works for most people, better for most setups. But there's another way, 
that we can do uh, caching for WordPress. And that is by caching in a separate process. And uh, some of these uh, softwares that perform uh, this is uh, Varnish, uh, Nginx, which is also a web server, but it can also do caching, and uh, Squid. And if we look at this graph again, what we can see is that, uh, in this case, we're using Varnish. Um, it places itself uh, ahead of the web server. So instead of going straight to Apache, you are going to hit Varnish first. And um, this means that all the caching and everything is handled in Varnish, so you don't need any additional caching plugins for, for WordPress. And it looks a little bit something like this. So for an anonymous visitor, he would just be getting to Varnish. Varnish would, would say that, oh wait, I already have this page, and then it would return the content. But unfortunately, Varnish suffers from the same problems as, as uh, regular caching uh, plugins, because um, we still have that problem of accidentally not wanting to accidentally cache other users' uh, data and mix it up. So we still separate so that logged in visitors uh, bypass uh, that uh, cache layer so that they go back to, to Apache and, and are forced to incur the whole um, time it takes to, to set up WordPress Connect database and all of that stuff. But Varnish, aside from this, Varnish uh, is also very powerful. It has its own configuration language. Um, and uh, you, can, you can say that you can hook into um, different times in the um, execution whenever a request comes in and perform stuff. So there's two methods that are kind of important that I wanted to mention. The first one is VCL receive, which always triggers when, when Varnish gets uh, a connection from some web browser that's wanting to load a page. And then you have VCL fetch, which is when Varnish returns uh, a page to the user's uh, browser. And actually, internally, Varnish works a little bit like this. And uh, it may look a bit complicated, but I, I just thought I'd break it down fairly uh, quickly uh, how it works. So. You see that little smiley guy, he's trying to load a page, and all of the other boxes then are Varnish. So first of all, Varnish receives the request, and it goes into VCL underscore receive. And at this point, we have the request, we know all the headers, the cookies, uh, all the URL, everything, and we can do stuff with it, thanks to the Varnish configuration language. And depending on our rules, we may or may not um, tell this request to go straight to the back end. An example that I'm going to show later is that when, whenever we're going to WP admin or WP login, we'd really like to go to the backend immediately. And if we want that, then we issue what's called a pass. So in this case, you can then see that the pass goes from VCL receive to Apache straight away. But if we don't pass the request, if it's something that we are going to cache, then Varnish goes ahead and does what's called a lookup. And that's the, the little red uh, arrow there. And Varnish has an internal cache, and it's going to look up. So if you're visiting for the first time, the page is going to look up the, the page and in the cache, and it's going to see that the page does not exist uh, in the cache. And then it's, that's going to issue what's called the VCL, VCL miss, which is going to go to the back end. The back end then is going to respond. We're going to go into VCL fetch, which is when we have the response from the back end, and we can also do stuff um, then, depending on what the, the request headers and um, other parameters in the response from the web server look like. And then finally, that gets passed to VCL deliver, which just uh, puts out the, uh, the request to the, to the browser. And in the case of um, that the second time somebody visits the same URL, we're going to go into VCL receive. It's going to go to lookup. Uh, in the cache, and then that's going to be a, a hit because we've already cached that page. So we're just going to skip all of the other stuff and go straight to VCL deliver from there. And I know 
it's gonna feel like like magic at first, but uh, I promise it's it's it, the documentation for varnish is great, and once you get started working with it practically, it's 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 quite uh, it's quite um, easy to understand. So what would we need to kind of start using varnish with WordPress? Pretty much this. So this is the what's called the default varnish configuration file. And um, first of all, we have to say, we have to let Varnish know where our Apache server is so that it can know where to send the requests that then go through to WordPress in the end. So at the, at the top here, you can, send, you can see that we send what's called the backend. And then we set it to host 127.0.0.1, which is the same machine. And then the port is 8083 in this case. And that's where we then tell uh, Apache to listen to. And then we go into VCL receive. And if we just go back, we can see that VCL receive is when the request gets uh, fetched from the user's browser. So that's the first thing that happens. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that whenever a request comes in, set the request backend to be the local web server that we configured above. So that's going to go through to Apache. And then we're going to say pass anything that starts with WP dash login or dash admin to the backend. And that's why you see you have the request URL WP dash login or admin. And then we issue a return pass. And if we go back to the sketch, we can see that that pass would then go straight to the Apache backend. And the reason we do that is that we never want anyone going to WP admin and being served uh, a cached copy. So what are the problems with, with this type of, of uh, caching? Now we've seen the, the two different kinds uh, as plugins or as external services such as Varnish. But they both suffer from similar problems. Um, it's they're simple. You know, you go to a URL, and then the next time someone goes to it, then it's it's saved, and you don't have to go to WordPress every time. And it can be 95 or even more uh, percent uh, efficient. But it's 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 dumb. I mean, it's not possible to um, it's not possible to show uh, customized content for each user. User, for example, for example. So you can't. Um, you can't show different things to different visitors to your site. It's all going to be very static. And uh, how can we how can we solve this problem and have caching but still allow users to have some dynamic content on the pages? So we we talk about the edge site include feature, and uh, edge site includes are a uh, worldwide web consortium specification since 2001. And it's implemented in, in various uh, softwares such as the ones we've talked about, Varnish, Nginx, and I think even some pl WordPress plugins support it, like W3 Total Cache has some support for edge site includes. But what they essentially are, uh, it's uh, a way to, to ask um, your caching um, software to load a second page as part of your first page. So you can kind of see it as a, as a PHP require statement, but it also works remotely. So let's have a look at, at that. This is an example of an edge site include. So this is just something you put in the HTML code of your page. And whenever Varnish will see this, you will say, OK, that means I have to Actually, right here, I have to load example.com-file.php. And whatever comes back from there, I have to insert it into the page. And you don't have to use a full URL. You can just use a slash, which means that it's going to be done on the same uh, domain that you are currently, uh, currently on. So. Let's do a simple example of this. Let's say that we have a, a, a page, and this is just a standard WordPress install, and I've installed Varnish as well. And if you see here in the left, um, in the left sidebar, 
I have a little lucky number uh, widget. And what I'd like to do is to have this lucky number widget be, um, be refreshed every time the user loads the page. So even if, uh, even if the page, word, even if it's cached in, in, in Varnish, we still want to have that little part of the page be dynamic and change every time the, the user refreshes it. So if we break it down, this is kind of what we want. We want everything to be cached, but that little part um, to be dynamic. So how can we do this with uh, WordPress and Edge site includes? So first of all, uh, we'd like to enable Edge site include support in Varnish, which is easy. I want to show you how to do that. Uh, we'd like to whitelist our Edge site include URL from being cached because our Edge site include URL is going to be also on the on the WordPress site. Uh, that's also going to be cached then. So we want to whitelist it in Varnish. And then we want to create a simple WordPress widget and a simple edge site include endpoint that shows a random lucky number. So let's start by enabling edge site, um, edge site include support in Varnish. And it's quite easy. All we need to do is uh, add a line to the edge site include, um, uh, sorry, to the Varnish configuration. And you can see that there, set bresp do as ESI equals true. And that will then uh, process edge sign includes inside your document. Then we need to whitelist the URL that our edge site include file is going to be in. And in this case, I've created a little plugin that I'm calling WordCamper News. And you can see here that I'm whitelisting the WP Content Plugins WordCamper News plugin edge site include so that anything in that folder will not be cached by, by Varnish so that we can keep it dynamic. And then we're going to create a WordPress widget. And <laughs> actually, creating a WordPress widget is a lot of code. This doesn't even actually fit on the whole screen, but it's just a lot of boilerplate to create a widget. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to be having a link to a GitHub repository where you can see full examples of all of this that I'm talking about. But essentially, the, the most interesting part is when we're outputting the widget. So let's look at that function. So this is what will be outputted by the widget in the sidebar. And as we can see, we have our edge set include tag, which is going to be output in the HTML. And then we use the plugins URL function to generate a full URL to our plugin. And then we go into the edge setting ESI folder and to the file luckynumber.php. And um, now we're going to look at what that file looks like. Yep, not that hard. So this is then the luckynumber.php file that we want to keep dynamic. And um, if you look, to this, at this wonderful graph again, just to, so we can orient ourselves in the process. VCL uh, fetch, that's where the edge side includes are, are being, uh, um, that's where they are being processed. So um, when our request goes through, it, um, uh, Apache will, uh, WordPress will respond with the edge side include tag. And then when we're in VCL fetch, then Varnish will pick it up and it's going to load our lucky numbers edge site include file. So you can see it kind of like this if we go back to the, uh, um, to, the to one of the previous diagrams, you can kind of see uh, an edge site include as poking a hole into the, um, the static caching layer that Varnish provides. So what will happen is that um, whenever a, a user visits the page, every time he visits the page, he will load the edge site include. So that will still be dynamic. So the great thing about this setup is that we can configure caching between the WordPress backend and the edge site include call to be completely different. In our case, we'd like to, the edge site include call to not be cached at all. 
while we'd, we'd like the regular WordPress backend calls to be cached normally. And thanks to uh, Varnish, we can, we can do this. And the result looks something like this. You can see that the lucky number is changing every time I'm refreshing the page, but the rest of the page is actually cached. So we'll never call WordPress. So now we have enough to start kind of thinking about building a simple paywall. But what do we need for that? Well, first of all, we need a way to allow users or subscribers, users with the subscriber role in WordPress to sign in. We also need to restrict uh, reading certain posts or articles uh, to users that are logged in. And we'd like to keep it simple and use the existing WordPress login system for this. But how do you use the WordPress login system without actually loading WordPress? So let's try to break it down. We have this page again, and I have now a sign in form as a widget to the left, and I have the post content uh, to the right. And if we look at it in the kind of static dynamic kind of sense, we get something like this. You know, we'd like the login form to be dynamic so we can show if the user is signed in or not. And we'd like the content to be dynamic so that we can decide whether we should show the content to the user or not. The rest of the page doesn't have to be dynamic, so we'll keep it static. So what do we need to make all this happen? Well, first of all, we need a special uh, cookie for that we're going to use for our users who are subscribers, but not administrators of the site. So when the when users log in, we're going to assign the is subscriber cookie to them. And then we want to throw away all, all of the other cookies because WordPress actually sets a couple of cookies on whenever you sign in, regardless of your um, uh, your user class. And if Varnish finds a cookie, it's going to say, nope, we're not going to cache that. So we want to throw all those away. And then we want to send the user cookie, or rather the is, whether the user is a subscriber or not, uh, to the edge side include. We also need to create, of course, the edge side include that will show the login logout box depending on if the user is logged in or not. And then it would be nice if we could somehow grab this login logout box actually from WordPress because WordPress has um, all of the you know configuration and it actually has functions for generating login and logout uh, boxes. So. It's a lot, but let's try to see how we can kind of make that happen. Let's see here. All right. Maybe the heaviest slide of the presentation. So whenever a subscriber, if we start from the left, whenever a subscriber uh, is uh, logging in, we're going to set a cookie called is subscriber. And then um, we are going to actually take this uh, cookie, and then we're going to pass it through Varnish into the edge side include. And so, as you can see, when if you check the first green line, the Varnish cache rules line, whenever whatever non-dynamic portions of the page we have, all of that is going to be cached there. But then the login form and the content of the page is going to go right through, and then we're also going to pass through whether the user is a subscriber or not. And so that means in the edge side include, we'll know the user and if he's a subscriber or not. But then we also want the edge side include to fetch content from WordPress. And uh, what we do then is that edge, the edge side include will basically just act as a simple authenticator to see if the user is logged in or not, and then pass if the user, depending on the um, login status, it's going to fetch the login or logout form from WordPress. So first of all, let's throw away all the cookies. So here's a varnish 
um, configuration that's basically saying if there is a cookie called WP subscriber equals one, then we're gonna throw all of the cookies away. But if you throw all of the cookies away, how are we going to uh, pass them to the edge side include once we pass varnish? Well, there is a, a kind of a, a solution for this, and that is to take the cookie and rewrite it as an HTTP header. So that cookie value will then be passed through as an HTTP header, and we're gonna see how we're gonna pick that up uh, right now. So this is, this is just some boilerplate code. What it does is it takes a cookie and it rewrites it into a, a header value. So in this case, if you see a line, let's see here, it's this line here, we pick up the cookie called WP subscriber, and then we rewrite it into a header called subscriber info. So that's, that's really all this does. And so this is our edge set include then, that's gonna decide whether we should show the login or log out form. So the first thing it's gonna do is of course, check if the user is a subscriber or not, or if he, also meaning if he's logged in or not. And then depending on that, it's, it's going to call the log out form or the login form respectively. So let's first look at how we can pick up this value that we sent from um, that we sent whether the user is subscribed or not as a header. This is the function that authenticates the user. What it does is first it gets all the headers and then it looks for that header we set that we rewrote from the cookie and then depending on the value it will return whether the user is authenticated or not. And this is just a simplified example. I mean, we don't have to send, you know, just one or zero. We can actually send along information that also uh, uniquely identifies the user. And in the GitHub repository, you're gonna find an example which is more complicated that shows how to actually um, also authenticate which user it is right here. And then this is the function we call for uh, grabbing the login or logout box from the WordPress backend. And what this function does is basically it, it contacts a special URL in WordPress and uh, then it saves that it caches that response as a file. And the reason for that is that we don't want to boot WordPress every time. So because if we if we would go into this edge side include to show the login or logout box and we'd have to contact WordPress every time to get the login or logout box, then that kind of nullifies the, what we're getting from this. So we, we want to put a cache layer on the edge side include so that we don't um, grab the content from WordPress every time. So what is this grabbing content from WordPress in this case? Well, we call it the, the backend API. So it's very simple, really. We want to make WordPress uh, trigger a JSON response on a special parameter. In this case, uh, the parameter is WordCampers internal API equals one. And then from there, we want it to return the login or logout form, just the HTML for it. And then also, of course, we need to make Varnish pass this URL so that it's always dynamic. So here's what that looks like, and this is part of WordPress. So this is actually part of a plugin, and it has access to all of WordPress and all of its uh, all of its uh, functions. So basically, we hook onto template redirect, which is uh, the hook that is basically the latest hook before the output starts coming in from WordPress, and we actually check to see. If, um, if we have this special get parameter that will trigger our backend API, we set the application JSON content types because we're gonna res uh, return a, a JSON response. And then if the action is login form, we're gonna just call WP login form, which will generate the HTML and return that. Or if the action is, oh, it's supposed to say logout form, then we just generate a very simple 
logout form link for the user. And for that's just for the login and logout uh, boxes, so to speak. Then for grabbing the post content, it's the same procedure. We need to create an edge site include to, to get content from the back end. And we need to create a back end API um, URL so that we can grab any content we want. And code examples for this, we don't have time to do it right now, but code examples for this are uh, available on the GitHub uh, uh, repository at the end of the talk. So essentially what, what we have accomplished is to have almost all of our page be uh, static or, and cacheable. And then for just some parts of it, such as the login, logout form, the content, or some other uh, thing that you want to keep dynamic, uh, we, actually let work, uh, we actually let Varnish pass those through to a special edge site include that will then handle it. So that means we can have pages that are uh, almost fully cacheable and then have a very lightweight edge site include authentication layer that can uh, then grab dynamic content. So I thought I was going to show a um, little demo of this that we did. Um, at Aftonbladet, we recently um, started allowing, we have a big blog network there, it's built in WordPress, and we recently started allowing uh, bloggers to um, lock their posts. So at Aftonbladet, there is something called Aftonbladet Plus, which is a premium service, which is basically a paywall. Um, the only difference between what we've talked about and this solution is that we don't authenticate in WordPress because there is an external login system that other uh, sites use it w as well. So we have a third party logon system to handle the content, uh, to handle the login. And then, but then we still have the edge site include to, to serve up the content. So this is the locked blog page. And what you can see here is that actually all of the, these parts here are cached. So if we just reload that, you can see it's going pretty quick. But this part here is the article content. And that, that part is being locked with an edge site include. So let's try to log in and see if we can open this content up. So what that, what's going to happen is that we're going to go to the external authentication system. And then I'm going to sign in. And then we are going to be uh, returned back to the content. But now that we have this uh, special cookie set, the content is unlocked. All right. Let's review a little bit what we've talked about so far. Scaling for high traffic can be a real challenge, um, as we've seen. And uh, caching is a viable alternative. So that's something that a lot of people use, even in, in very large um, enterprises. And that is uh, very functional. And caching doesn't have to be static. You, you can actually have. Um, dynamic parts uh, of your page that are still otherwise cached. And then of course that varnish configuration and edge site includes uh, are very powerful and valuable tools to allow this to happen. So just in closing, I've pushed almost everything I've talked about here in the, uh, in the GitHub repository and I'm going to be pushing a more uh, fully featured example, including a Vagrant box uh, sometime during uh, next week. So thank you, and may the traffic be with you. <laughs>
Um, how, how do you, um, if varnish is uh, before the Apache, yes. uh, how, how can you, um, if, if, if a subscriber, uh, sorry, um, an editor finds a typo in a cached um, content, how can you tell Varnish to drop that page from WordPress? Or do you have to have access for Varnish, or how do you tell Varnish to drop it? So we didn't talk about this, but, but Varnish has a, what's called a purge command. So you can make uh, just, there are even plugins for this available, but you can just very easily, whenever a post gets updated in WordPress, you just issue a purge command, and the purge command is just an HTTP request that you send to Varnish, and then you send along the URL that you want to purge, and then Varnish will instantly drop it from its cache. So that whenever the next user comes in, then that's going to be a cache miss. It's going to go into Var it's going to go into the back end, and it's going to be fetched again. So that's actually something we don't have implemented right now, but that we've been uh, looking at. If you can make the purging automatic, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You just hook on whenever a post gets updated uh, with a WordPress hook, um, and then you send that command. Hello. Thanks for a great talk on a very hard and technical problem. Uh, when using ESI includes, uh, I'm guessing that you would have to, to install Varnish on your local environment as well, since the page wouldn't render properly without a Varnish in front of it? Yes, absolutely. When the, you see the second link here, it's going to the WordCamper News Vagrant. That's actually a fork of an, an excellent uh, Vagrant environment uh, made by the WP Engine team, I think, which is called Mercury. And that what you do is you, you just, if you've used Vagrant, if, I'm sure you've seen, some of you have seen the, the earlier talk, you just clone that, you do Vagrant up, that's gonna provision everything to just work the way you, uh, you want to. And then there's still a couple of small steps you need to take to, such as to enable uh, edge side includes for them to work properly. And, and all of that will be in the readme so that you can get started easily building on this. All right, great, thanks. Hello, uh, what happens if uh, Varnish goes down? What is rendered then? If, if Varnish goes down, I guess nothing since Varnish is the entry point. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I had almost the same question. Uh, what happens if the backend goes down uh, when you have edge size include? Ah. Does it wait for, or is it if it's overloaded and slow? Does it wait for the all the edge size includes to incomplete, or can it serve a stale cache or something before, or what happens? Yeah, we we didn't have time to cover it, but but there's more benefits to Varnish than what we've talked about. Varnish has an excellent system called uh, for, uh, which is referred to as soft expiration, so that for example, if you have a page and then that your backend actually goes down, but the page is still in cache, Varnish will, will actually not just drop the cache entry. It will try to load the page from the backend before updating the cache. So if your backend just goes down, but the response is still cached, then Varnish is going to go into soft expiration mode, which means that it's going to try to fetch that page every now and then, because it keeps getting errors from it, but it's still going to serve it from the cache while it's um, while it's still in there, and there's a special configuration you can set, which just say that if your backend goes down, just keep everything in cache for usually it's like 12 or 24 hours. So if you're really lucky, you can have your backends go down, and Varnish will just keep serving up traffic for most users like normal. So that's also an additional hardening layer uh, for a, for a site. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs>